Alright. Now let's uh, do that. And there. a rondo i think from ms84 and then and the next one's a rondo from an ms87 i believe
was Sonata um, Opus 3 number one. Sonata Opus 3 number one Paganini. Originally for violin and guitar.
just kind of stretch this out a little bit. So those sonatas were in order. <clears throat> Scarlatti, um, K11. Um, one second, K175. And I believe K380. Now let me just double check that here on my folder. Um, yeah, K11. It's actually in this folder here. Hold on. Mm -hmm. There it is. Yeah, 380. So that was K11, K175, and K380. K11, I believe, was first. Um, I'm pretty sure Segovia was the first to do that one, quite certain. 175, I'm thinking John Williams, maybe not, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. And 380, I think, is also John Williams. Could be wrong, but that's how I recall it in terms of how I was introduced to it. Relatively new strings, so I really got to stretch out this bass string so it doesn't go out of tune when I'm playing. Uh, street meat wants to hear motion potion. You probably try it later on. Uh, I do have a glass slide for that. Yeah, I remember Einstein's Schneebly. That's when people would come and talk to me while I'm playing, and I'd have to just shut it right out. Because once you get pissed, it's over. Um, yeah, that's because uh, I do. Yeah, that's uh, George and uh, Trifon. Just because I like the bird imagery. Um, Ninth fret harmonics. Yeah. Um, Prayer of Grief and Sorrow has ninth fret harmonics. Um, yeah, Hoodie does say Children of Bottom. Um, through through uh, Jumping Spider, he, so you were playing my tunes while you were getting your degree? That's, Sounds like a hell of a time. Yeah, every now and then I look out the window. You'll see me doing that. I'm trying to see if the woodpecker will uh, show up. And if it does, I'll just switch cameras. Tagalar from Turkey. I've been there once. I went to Istanbul once, only for a day. That was the tour of like 2015, I think. Maybe 16, but I'm thinking 15. like I played in Denmark and then I drove to uh, the Copenhagen airport took like two hours flew to Turkey played came back the next day and then um, went on the ferry down to Germany yeah that was that was a really uh, oh, that was crazy all right so Scarlatti
That was K477. First guitar player I heard do that was Fabio Zanon of Brazil. I'm pretty sure he was the first one to do it. He says it was Carlos Barbosa Lima who did that one first, but I couldn't find any evidence that there was a recording of it, so I don't know. But um, when I saw him play, when I saw Fabio Zanon play when I was like 20, um, I was like, I want to learn that piece. So he actually really inspired me to do Scarlatti. All right. 
A160. I changed string gauge, and so still getting used to the feel. But I like these better though. Slightly lower tension. Ontario, yeah, I used to live there. I'm in New Brunswick now, Robin Murray, and um, Acoustic Metallus Plectrus. Yeah, it's been a long time since I played that. I played it on tour a couple times, but it has been a long time. From me, my dog, and a CNC shop in Whitewater, Wisconsin, Euclid. Right on. Pictures at an exhibition? Nah, I mean, I probably wouldn't devote the time uh, to it. One second, uh, I'm just reading a couple of these here. Yeah, no, I have another guitar for open C. I usually do like three hours of this, so, and I always just do the, uh, I, st I start with the classical stuff because I want to get better at doing that live because uh, that's what I want to uh, play when I, when I, when I go and do shows now. This is um, an Alhambra. Let's do something here. Got that. Good. Okay. And then. Thank you. 
55. That's the uh, newest one that I've learned. I think it's the most difficult of the ones. Maybe not as hard as K53, but yes, in other ways. This part. Vitaly. Um, uh, other stringed instruments? Not really. I mean, a little bit of banjo and mandolin, but not enough to really say. And that was um, Peter C. asking, so not really. A little bit, but not too much. Thomas from North California. Nice area. That's probably the one of the only places in California you'd want to be. All right, time to move on maybe to Sevilla and then switch up. This helps me warm up for the other stuff. Yeah, Street Meat got that one. <laughs> North California, yeah, I mean, that's probably the only place I'd want to go there right now, anyway. Unless it's just to do a show and get out. tension string so I don't want to like stretch them too hard and then rip the thing right off so these machine heads are giving me problems the the ace the a string uh, machine head is like locking up and you have to really give it you know muscle and these are really good machine heads these are shalers the store when I called them I said yeah the guitar that you know remember that one that I got a while back it's still under warranty so they're gonna replace them but I mean they, could, they couldn't believe that it had malfunctioned
Sevilla. There was a part in there I normally mess up on that I got this time. This part right here. I think it's because the fingering is reminiscent of like some other piece that I play that um, I'll be like going down the road of the piece and then I'll see a fork in the road and I'll be like, oh, which one is it? And I'll have to like put the train back on the track, but I got it, uh, but I got it that time. Turn that back up. I guess I'm gonna do some repeats later. No sign of the woodpecker yet. That evening gross beaks out there. I might want to do K55 later again because I stopped and said um at this one part because it, it, it escaped me. I didn't know what it was. This part right here. I'd love to go to Germany again, actually. Josh, yeah, no, I had a great time there. Uh, I would probably do it a bit differently because when I toured before, I was um, doing it like alone. So all the driving, selling the merch, loading in, loading out, you know, managing the tour, managing myself because you have to, you have to like time your rest really intelligently if you're touring alone. And I just got so tired at one point. I was just like using caffeine, like just three Red Bulls just to get, get up in the morning. And you can't do that. So I'd probably do it a bit differently. And I probably wouldn't drive as fast on the, on the Autobahn because I mean, I was just like, I was doing six hour drives in three and a half hours because I was jacked up on caffeine, like super focused. You know, I had a, um, one of those, like an American sized car. And in the, in the European traffic system, you'll find that it goes down to this like two meter lane. And I was going fast down the two meter lane next to like trucks, like in a one inch clearance, nailing it. And I, I wouldn't do that now, but I mean, I've had the driver behind me, like when we finished going down the, 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 uh, the two meter lane, he comes to the side, he, he pulls up on the side and he's like, yeah, all right. Cause he was, he noticed that I was using like a, uh, an American sized vehicle, one of those four doors, like in, in Europe, the only the narrow cars tend to go down the two meter lane, unless you really got good control of the wheel. I don't, I don't know Astorius actually. It's not in my repertoire. But yeah, Germany, I'd love to go back there. But it's just a promotional, um, I guess a promotional issue as well as one of the things that was a pain in the ass is I, I like to use a lot of guitar, a lot of guitars. I like to have a seven string, a six string, uh, a nylon string, multi ac and a classical, ideally. But that, you know, if you're, if you're gonna fly all that on an airline, that's like $700 worth of luggage, sometimes more than the plane ticket if it's a short hop. Although I've worked out something with Godin guitars where they can let me, <clears throat> I guess, borrow them from distributors, wherever those distributors might be, and then give them back at the end of the tour. That could work, but then there's still that little issue of starting the tour on guitars I haven't played before. I've done it, like I've had it when I toured China five times. Every time I went, it's like, here's, here's the guitar you're playing. I'm like, okay. And the more, the more you get comfortable with like customization or like when you've decided on what um, string spacing you like, it's actually difficult to go back to standard nut width. I like two inch, even 2.2. .2. I like width so I can, get my fingers in between the strings and even I even like a two inch nut with a pick like an old Martin for example like old Martin style um, string spacing so that's the thing is that when it comes to touring it's all about just like the money to lug your guitars or the logistics of where the car where you know where they're going to come from how are we going to do for the shipping and it's just money stacked up on top of money stacked up on top of money and next thing you're like holy shit it's like twenty thousand dollars just to just to like get there and get everything going I guess because the, the vehicle rental can be expensive too. If I recall correctly for the 2011 Candy Rat Tour, it was like 5,000 something US dollars for like a month and a bit of the, of the rental van. Three, four weeks of it anyway. That's without insurance. And, I, and they didn't tell, <laughs> I had no idea it was uninsured and I was getting behind the wheel just like, all right, let's go. Didn't know it was not insured. Actually, speaking of uh, oh, Nitro from India, yeah, I, I don't know Banger Integration Therapy anymore, maybe a couple of riffs. 
it only works with the finger picks to get the sound. I can explain a bit more about that later. Let me just move these books here. Because I'm going to talk about books later when all this is done in a couple hours. Hold on a second. All right, you go there. Bang. Actually, I just finished reading this. The Ramayana. Um, Nitro, you probably know this. I found it to be quite interesting. It's another example of um, the idea of a God coming in the flesh. So, you know, with Christianity, it's God coming in the form of Jesus. And in uh, Hinduism, it's uh, Vishnu coming in the form of Lord Rama. But it's actually Vishnu comes in the form of four brothers. And the highest concentration of his divine power is within Rama. And left to, lesser, to a lesser extent in his, uh, in his three brothers. But yeah, no, it was pretty, uh, I enjoyed it. Anyway, so. So you were there um, at the 2011 tour, Josh. Yeah, no, that was a, that was a fun time. It was uh, we were, first time we all got together, at least with yeah, me, Gareth, and Craig. Yeah, that was a good, uh, and then it was, um, who else was it? Stefano Baroni, and then uh, Antoine joined later on, and then Pete Chaluzzi joined. That was a fun time. That was back when the before all hell break loose. Or before all hell broke loose. Oh, he does. Buckethead travels in a passenger van. Yeah, no, it's just it's it's the money. Like touring is just all money. It's just that's the that's the main thing. To the plane tickets, and then the worst is when like you think you can bring a, a guitar on board and it's in a soft case, and then the. Uh, and, and then the, uh, the flight attendant just wants to be that way. And she'll, you know, this happened once. she's like, she, she let me have like one say. I was like, well, uh, I don't want to put it underneath because it's worth X amount of dollars. She's like, sir, if you don't, che if you don't check that underneath the plane, you'll, you'll have to leave the plane immediately. I was like, all right, fine. She went directly from like level zero to level 11, you know, in terms of like uh, enforcement of not bringing the guitar on the plane. So that can be a pain in the ass when you get on the plane and then, okay, and then once it's underneath in a soft case, 50-50, whether, whether it makes it there without, you know what I mean, being destroyed. And uh, so all those things pretty much set up a situation where the best thing to do is to have a guitar company lend you guitars. And uh, the thing is, like I said, because you're not used to, the, used to the guitars, the first few shows I don't play my best because like with all the practice that I do, all of the memory and the muscle memory is like right down to the micro millimeter of like the string spacing. Throw another guitar in my hands, I can make it sound good, but not as good as I can if I have time with it to, to, for, the instrument, for the instrument to settle or for me to settle into the instrument rather. So yes, uh, Josh, I do have some new originals, I guess you might say, um, on the new album. Uh, yeah, but in terms of the finger style stuff you're saying. Um, yeah, there was some stuff on Tribunal of Penance, and then what was on the latest one? Let me just remind myself here, because I just lose track of all the stuff I put out. Oh, Country Style Etude and C, that was a new one. In Her Dark Den Dance Devils, the 2023 version, and the rest is like New Scarlatti Time 3, and then the multi-guitar the multi -guitar stuff, which it's, I mean, I don't have backing tracks for a lot of it, because, I mean, that's another money thing. If you want to have that live, that's like dual output sound card, uh, two sets of mastered backing tracks, one with the click track, one without the click track, and I would need an in-ear monitoring system to feed me the, the, the backing track with the clicks so I can, you know, jump in and out of, you know, certain parts because um, certain, certain tunes have one guitar part and then two and then three and then one. And so for the duration of the song where it's only one guitar, I would need a pulse so that when I reach the part where the other guitar comes in, bang, I'm on, I'm on point. And so in order for that situation to occur, you need two sets of backing tracks. One with the click track that I hear, so I can time, you know, time myself accordingly, and the other backing track without the clicks that goes to the audience. And then the in-ear monitoring system, and so that whole thing, and then there's the cost of getting some guy to master those backing tracks. You see where I'm going, it's quite a lengthy process. So a lot of the stuff that I record, I just see it as like studio art, and I just play classical and um, whatever else. Oh yeah, cream dog. That's honestly one that I haven't done in like a while. I'll pull up the tab and like, I'll maybe try and pull off a riff. I'll try and learn my own riff in front of you guys. How about that? Uh, I will try and learn my own riff. All right, so I got it up. We'll do it in a bit because I got to. I have to switch and do 
a couple things. Now, not to release level 20 because the ending was nonsensical. It just kind of, it's in the demo. It doesn't really progress. And then it comes to a point where it's like, okay, let's just end this. And it's like, oh. So I just, in my opinion, it wasn't structured well enough. Uh, maybe I could, uh, um, maybe I could, uh, I guess, revisit level 20 and try and finish it. But I found more freedom in compositions uh, when I left open tuning because they don't modulate well. And so you find a lot of guitar players when you're using open tunings, you can get some really ambient grooves going and you can do theme and variations in terms of riff and then you know, uh, variation in the rhythm, but not necessarily, not necessarily in the tonal center. So in that case, um, I found more freedom in writing when I was doing two and three part guitar stuff like my, the stuff on YouTube that I do, like Porcupine Dilemma and Haunted by Hell and these things, because I can just completely focus on standard tuning and I can go to about two other keys before bringing it home. I think visiting two keys is probably like a good goal, I find, in composition. Um, start in one key, go to another, maybe back, and then go to another, and then a third key, and then come back, something like that. Maybe not in that order, but yeah, it wasn't until, because with, a, with open tuning, you'll find it's like especially open C or variations of it like C minor seven, open C seven. It's difficult to, to modulate. Like uh, you can do modulating to the, um, what would it be? Like just it's the, the tonic minor, just going from C major, C minor and back. But to go to five is kind of difficult because of just the way, just the way it is. You lose the character of what you were doing in terms of like the aggressiveness of the bass notes because of where that puts you on the fretboard, you can't devote yourself entirely just to, I don't know, I guess what voicings would sound good. So that's why, that's a long story of why I didn't um, release level 20, is because it just had a couple of riffs and then it just faded off. And so I'm like, that's probably not good enough to put on an album. Will I do covers of popular songs? Probably not, it's not my thing. I mean, that's actually the, um, that's the format for YouTube success. If you want to increase your viewership, so what you do is you look at the analytics in terms of uh, you look at the Google searches for what songs are trending, what are what people are what people are searching for the most, and so you can spot that there's guitar players who are playing that game. So whenever a new song comes out, it's trending in the in the, in the Google report analytics. And what you do is you cover that song, you know, put it in the keywords so that people are directed and they get it in their suggestions. And so you're piggybacking off of, uh, for example. I guess whatever's trending. It's, it's, a, um, it's a method of YouTube success. I don't do it just because, I just, I just don't like it. I just don't like that. I, it, just, it, doesn't, it doesn't interest me. It seems like more work than I'd rather put into it in terms of the result that I get. Because I'm not sure that I want to gather that sort of audience, to be frank. Because then they're, they'll think, oh, we, we want to hear that all the time, right? And then so I'd have like, who knows, about 100,000 people show up if I go down that road for five years and build, and build the channel doing covers. Then when they show up, they want to hear that. Now I'm stuck learning stuff I don't want to learn. Pretty much that's how that goes. One second here. Got to get a quick drink. I'll be right back. Switch up guitars and okay. We're good. Yes, I, lo I love finished metal. Kalma and but Children of Bottom is probably my favorite. Very much so. Like really, really good writing. He knew, he knew. Alexi knew what he was doing in terms of writing. He would change keys, and it was perfect for the style of metal. And uh, yeah, just it's probably some of the best metal there is, in my opinion. They're on my MP3 player, and I listen to them every day when I go for a run, or five times a week. So not every day, but yeah, it's all it's all there. One second, be right back.
here yet, folks. Still, still watching for that. One moment, anyone? No. Should happen though. Yeah, no. When it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the spacing, um, that to me is is. Uh, like I used to be able to play with narrow spacing, like standard, I don't know, what is it, 1.7 or 1.6 something, I don't know what it is. Um, I guess I can do it, but I've adapted so much to wider spacing that I'll start, you know, the pick will start, you know, zinging other strings and, I don't know, bumping into the other strings and so forth. Max power, diet to lose weight, intermittent fasting, eat between nine, and, nine in the morning and 2 p.m. And then if you can, don't eat on Fridays and do that for like a year. And then the following year, go down to one meal a day and don't eat on Fridays. And then, yeah, you, you'll, you'll probably have to um, incorporate more fiber because your intestines will slow down a bit. And so you'll need that to keep things moving. But that's pretty much what I found. Uh, intermittent fasting, you have to deplete your blood sugar so that the glycogen reserves are used up and then it switches to fat burning because a lot of us, as far as I can tell, are just used to having sugar in our systems all the time because the entire food supply chain is literally poisoned with sugar, top to bottom, left to right. I mean, go try to find tomato sauce in a grocery store. I'm like, okay, sugar, sugar, sugar. And then there's this one brand down here that's like $4 more than the rest, no sugar in it, whoopie do. You see what I mean? It's literally in everything. And uh, some people's bodies are different. And I think that some people are so that if there's any sugar in their system, their body won't touch any of the reserves, the adipose tissue, so you might, so you might call it. And so you really just have to cut out sugar as one of the main things and get used to it. And it can be difficult because at first it's like, you feel like you get up and you're, you're seeing stars and you're, you're lightheaded, but that lessens over time. Um, okay, hold on here. Let me, just, let me just acclimate to the picking now because I'm coming from the classical world. Yeah, sugar is an extremely addictive drug. People don't give it the, the seriousness it deserves. I think, I think that it actually, um, I, th I think that it actually causes behavioral disorders in children because it has the effect of an addiction. And so children are experiencing the effects of an, ad of an addiction, which manifests as maybe, and for some of them, I don't know, demanding behavior, um, anger, and things like that. And so I think that's actually, it's actually related to sugar. But yeah, try it. If you try and get off sugar and carbs, it's like, and you're used to burning uh, uh, sugar as your main source of energy, when you switch over, it's just like your body goes nuts. Like I would get up and hold the wall and like, <laughs> until my body started to really learn, like it doesn't happen anymore. I cannot eat all Friday and do 40 hours of the food and stand up and move and be okay. Yeah, exactly. Sugar is major, majorly addictive. And the withdrawal, uh, a lot of children go through withdrawal and I don't think they know that's happening to them because everyone's given them vanilla pudding cups and we've got like the dancing, we got the dancing, uh, what do you call them? The dancing mascots that are like, hey kids, we're having fun. It's like, yay. And then because it really makes you happy. And what's interesting is if you get into fasting, <clears throat> your body will feed you, all, feed you all these memories of the past when you're eating. And you'll just, you'll just be overcome with all these different memories of, oh, I forgot about that. And then what you'll realize is that a lot of the joys and the pleasures of life were literally just timed according to sugar and eating. And so much of life was just the pleasure of eating because that's what we were raised in. And to actually stop that, right? Parents can't say no, but at the same time, um, if you're parenting a child that has an addiction to sugar, that can be really difficult. Like, I mean, that can stress, it pushes them to the limit. They don't know what to do. At the same time, the stuff that's affordable within the economic bracket that they're in is actually the crap, the crap which loaded with sugar in it. So then it's like you have this problem where if you want to, if you want to eat stuff that's not loaded with sugar, it's going to cost you three times as much. And then it just becomes like a, yeah, so... You know what I'm saying? One of those things in life that's rigged, for the most part. How are we doing for volume? Let me check here. Yeah. Let me just turn that down. And this. 
<laughs> yeah, try try finding something. Try finding like tomato sauce without sugar. When you fr- when you first try to get it out of your diet, you, you think you're in a madhouse where it's like someone slipping in at everything. Like you're in like you woke up in the rat's maze, and the overlords like you realize the overlords' plan is working perfectly, and you, <laughs> it's in everything. Like even in a can of fish, you're like, why that? Why is it in a can of fish? That's not necessary. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. People underestimate it. I mean, I've gotten off of, uh, I mean, cigarettes. I actually think sugar was harder. Cigarettes is pretty damn, it's, it, that, like, that's a hard one to kick, but sugar, it's, it's insidious because it's, it's, it was always there, your whole, our whole lives. Just, we didn't realize that it was regulating our moods. And so by putting it in the food, what, what it does is it, um, it realigns the hunger mechanism so that it requires you know, these series of products to satiate it. So no longer is the hunger mechanism satiated by actual food. It's satiated by this specific food that's obviously, you know what I mean, being marketed to people with joyous dancing rabbits and this and that. So yeah. Right, I got to stop talking or else I forget how to play. Let me just warm up here. Caprice number one, under the bridge. So tabs, I mean, just go to youandobson.com, click on store, and then you'll see the link underneath each album. So according to the album that it's on. Or usually it's in the video description. Um, usually it's in the video description in terms of the, the Fast Spring store that I got um, set up. If it's on a Candy Rat release, it'll be on the Candy Rat web, uh, website. But yeah, no, it's true. Sugar is harder to quit than cocaine. Um, so basically, <clears throat> apparently the hierarchy of, of drugs is like apparently heroin's the hardest one to quit because it's apparently just, it solves all your problems. It's the, it's the chemical that just makes everything great. That's why it's the most lethal because it actually is the most effective. Sugar, then cocaine. That's how it is. Because I mean, <clears throat> yeah. Try getting off of it. Whew. Oh, the Schopenhauer shirt. You, I just got that made. I, I took the the common license picture of him in high definition, and then I sent it to a company in Toronto called Toronto Tees, and you design it on the website, and you just pay for it, and then they, they print it and send it to you. Buckethead watching this from a KFC in Ohio. That'd be cool. All right, so Squiffy quit sugar. Yeah, sugar was definitely the most brutal. Cigarettes is more like an emotional thing. Well, no, they're both emotional, but I mean, I don't know. How would I describe it? I think sugar actually takes longer. It takes, it takes a bit longer for your body to adjust without it. I think so. I know your pain too. You can find that on the uh, Insomnomania t- uh, link through the store. Yeah, so Squiffy's right. 
if you're on a limited income, I mean, you, you can't go and buy all fresh food. It's like a box of craft dinner. Sure, you can buy like 40 of those, right? And that's all just going to be like pure, you know, pure carbs. Audio is bad, really? Again, here, let me just take a look. Should be all right. Am I coming through? I don't drink coffee anymore. I used to live on it. I used to drink a full, I used to drink a pot in the morning. I used to drink, I used to drink like a massive, like four cups in one uh, cup of coffee and the two of them every day. And then a third one. Like I was ridiculous. When I refer to sugar, max power, um, simple carbs, I must, I, I would say, if you're serious about doing like the keto, I would say you can drop out of like any fruits that are high sugar as well until you get to where you want to go and then reintroduce them. All right, so audio sounds good. All right, so maybe it just maybe it might be just for that one guy, maybe it was buffering. <clears throat> but yeah, coffee, that's fairly addictive, but it's not the worst. I stopped coffee cold turkey, even though I was drinking huge, like a pot for, a, for my own mug. Tons of it. I got this one here. I'm going to practice a couple of riffs from this before I leap into it. I still enjoy playing learning covers. Well, technically, I guess you might consider classical stuff covers, so yes, but not covers in the sense of modern.
was asking if I'm orthodox. Honestly, no. I like the imagery of the uh, of the birds and just the whole idea of, I guess, as from the from an artistic sense of you know, um, I don't know, a, a solemn monk feeding birds as a as an example of uh, as an example of beauty in interaction with nature. But to say to that, do I actually believe what they say about certain saints that they're still alive? And this, I guess, I don't. But I don't have any issue with people that do. I mean, I'm quite. Um, uh, for whatever people believe, and I, if that's their choice, sometimes I discuss what I believe or what I don't believe. If it's forced on me in a, some sort of aggressive manner, perhaps I might give someone an earful. But I don't usually approach people and say, "Here's what you got to do." So you know what I mean? Is that the one? There's one in Phoenix, I know. I'm not sure. There's a, that's a well-known one. And then there's Meteora. I know some people that live in Meteora. I thought, oh, wait, here we go. Hello, yeah. All right, the woodpecker's here. Here we go, watch. Let's do this. I'm going to switch you over to... Oh, wait. Um, hold on. One second here. What's going on? Ah, oh, there we go. Bang. Okay, hold on one sec. Those are my squash plants. I'm going to go visit the woodpecker. Hello. Wait for the wind to die down. Here we go. Hello, yeah. Now this here I call Mr. Harry Woodpecker. Known this fellow about five years. He's the one that comes inside the house, inside the kitchen. Hello, yeah. That's the limit of which I can pet him. A little bit of that, and that's it. With the other hand, he'll go. But that's okay, a thumb. Here comes farm equipment or a tractor. And there you go. See, he takes a big chunk with him at the end. Anyway, these are my squash plants. Um, acorn squash, buttercup squash, winter celebration squash, and then watermelon over there. Anyway, there we go. One second. I gotta get back to the other room. Now, did that come through okay? Let me take a look. One second here. Lammy. Well, thanks for coming and uh, listening. Um, let's see here. Just reading, catching up here. 
Do I plug into electric guitar? No, because I need a wider nut width or else I can't pick. Like a, a standard electric guitar nut width, I just, I can't move as well. And there is, there is one brand of guitars, I think it's called Big Lou, and they're, I'm not sure how well made they are, but they have two inch nuts um, in terms of the string spacing and all that. But uh, that's what I would need, like a larger, one with a larger uh, you know, um, increased string space. One second here. So yeah, so the woodpecker thing happened. That's always cool. He'll probably be back in a couple hours, maybe two. Uh, the, what, what's he eating? It's called wild bird seed pie. And it's basically like a ground millet with ground bird seed and you know, red and white millet, a couple of different things. Um, and the company that makes it, Eco Crust, they're sending me a free box because I sent them the video of the woodpecker coming into the house and they said, we'll send you a free box of uh, bird seed pies. I'm like, cool. Thanks, Chris, for throwing in. Oh no, the plants aren't cannabis. You can tell they're, uh, they're three different types of squash and watermelon. I'm just getting them ready because uh, we still get one more bout of frost and then June 7th, you can put stuff in the garden. Haven't been to Antarctica. In terms of going to Brazil, someone was asking about going to Brazil. The same thing applies and essentially like just logistics. Can I get golden guitars to ship me guitars there so I can use them? If not, can I get can I, you know, do I have enough funds available to like check three or four guitars and underneath the plane, that type of stuff. Hardest piece to execute. I mean, when I, when I've had it ready, I mean, 50 K 53, but I haven't played that one in a while because I replaced it with K 55. No, it doesn't fly in. Uh, well, once he bounced off of the glass going on the way out and I just corrected that by pulling the blinds down. So he sees the vertical lines so he doesn't go for the upper portion of the window, but he doesn't ever fly into the window on the way in because he just, he just seems to know. All right, so one second here. Oh, it's this one. There. Good. No, I don't smoke anymore, but I used to. It take you have to you have to quit like ten times before you finally quit. Like you need to build up um, a, um, enough time where uh, you don't where where something doesn't happen. Like where if you encounter something in life that triggers you to reach for it as a crutch, you have to have enough times where you don't do that in order to build momentum the other way. A little bit more volume. Okay. So that was cool. The woodpecker came live on it. Doesn't always happen. Sometimes he'll like go off He's building a nest right now, I think, and preparing for the missus to lay eggs. And so he's all busy with that and doesn't come as much. But then once the young are born, he's here all the time. This Sure SM58 is giving me problems. And I asked them about it. I'd have to ship it in for repairs. I might just replace it with a 57. It's starting to cut out.
Focal piece number two. I got I worked that one up again. Yes, flat picking. Uh, yeah, flat picking. Um, Yeah, so the F the SM57, I mean, the SM58 here, I mean, this has been uh, the 81, sorry, the SM81. Sometimes it gets clogged and I have to flick it or blow on it in order to, for, to get it to work again for some reason. I don't know why. Thanks, Robert. Glad you're, glad you're liking it. I'm doing my best here. Um, time three, though. We'll do that later on. Um, too much anxiety from what? Oh right, you mean, you mean in terms of uh, what cannabis use, anxiety? Yeah, no, I no, I don't know what you mean. Some people think it, it uh, relieves anxiety. For me, it creates loads of it. It creates meltdowns, and then I make, then I make uncomfortable phone calls to people, and then they're like, "Are you all right?" <laughs> and then after I call, I'm like, "Oh, maybe I should have waited for that one to pass." Yeah, no, this is really um, starting to give me some issues here. Okay, I'm going to mute it for a sec. How's it doing? Let's hope it lasts. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, I think it works. Never mind. Let me get the translator going for this. Um, Eastern languages. Hold on. Where's your hat? Oh, it's um, it's in the other room. Um. Don't worry, time three will come later, which is, yeah, I mean, it's like a combination of time one, time two. So, yeah. Um, yeah, anxiety, yeah.
Winter by the Sea, the one guitar version without the harmonies. Let me see here. Hold on. Um... That still works. Do I even have that finger pick? I guess I could use one of the metal ones. I don't think I have the, the plastic one that I would normally use though. Can I even, okay, I used to use these. These metal finger picks here. Still got a bunch of them left over. Used to always use these ones here. But just started to feel really uncomfortable to use them. But does it work? Uh, maybe some of the riffs from it, but not all of them. Mike's cutting out, I'm out to switch. All right, one more chance. If this mic uh, doesn't, I have another backup. Thank you. 
Yeah, I haven't played that in who knows how long, a couple of years, <laughs> two years. And right, hold on. I'm gonna switch guitars to the seven string now. I can play Blood and Ice better. I haven't done it on this guitar. It's actually kind of weird with the extra string spacing. Second, switching guitars. Um, yeah, I know, and this mic's problematic. The Shure SM81, I think it's unreliable. <clears throat> and the best they can do is I have to pay to ship it to them for the, to fix it, so I might just switch it up. Maybe, maybe it'll behave. Seven string. Let's go. And some special sauce. I don't need those. It's still behaving. Yeah, we're good. special sauce it's called um that's called uh what is it called ghs g 
GHS fast fed. It's basically like a, some kind of like, like a lemon oil or something. What's that stick you put over your strings? A stick. I don't, know, I don't know what you mean by the stick that I put over my strings. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Yeah, the dude abides. That's a GHS fast fret. <laughs> okay. Seven string flat picking etude number one. It was actually, I played it for a friend of mine at the time over the phone. The ending. I originally did it minor but he's like you know you can end that on major and I'm like that's right and so I went with the major replicating time too without a delay pedal um you could do like doubling the notes but re really what get gives it its sound i guess would be the slight lesser volume of the repeated note like it's bouncing off of a wall kind of a thing and so if you actually play double notes it just sounds like you know you're just doing you know like uh so yeah Yeah, lovely that I can do that later. No problem. <clears throat> that one I know. All right, so there's, I'm going to do this other one here. 
I hope this mic keeps behaving. Nothing's more annoying than when a mic cuts out, especially when it's like a, an SM81. I mean, this should be not doing that. Let me just check the volume levels. There, short piece. Uh, so he didn't hear it cut out. Oh, okay, so. Hmm. I don't know what that is then. It could be, well, if he didn't hear it, then it can't be the mic, but it could have been earlier. If it did go out, it would have been, it would have been that this mic went out and then the direct from the guitar might have still been there, so you might have just heard like an element of the sound drop out. But it seems as though it's, um, it's working for now. How you doing, Chord Semro? here mm -hmm. here come the monsters Let's see what happens is it too loud <laughs> all right 
I'm gonna turn down, turn up the the um, accompaniment. How's that? Let's try that. See if that works. There. Let's here come the monsters from my last album. Um, 
Do, 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 do. Okay, now, so, cream dog. I don't even, okay, plan, we're not gonna play it well, but. Maybe a couple of the riffs. I can just sight read some of them. So I'm just looking at the tab here. First repeat to there. Okay. Um, okay. with the one riff that I remember it, it goes into uh oh two okay <laughs> Already running out of, I have to keep scrolling down. Uh, and then comes this big monster riff here. What was this one? so on and so forth but yeah that's just like from sight reading it because it's just been so long and the next part yeah i don't know we're going to switch up now to finger style on the nylon um portugal how you doing all right one second here switching guitars Dave Dumble in terms of, no, nah, I mean, that's always going to be a part of it, I think. I mean, at a young age, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Because at that age, I mean, it's unlikely that they're going to, like, know what music they want to play, you know, right right from the get-go. And they'll probably just need to try a bunch of different things and see if something sticks in terms of something they like to play. Because it can be a challenge getting them to play or to practice anything at that age. I was born in Toronto and grew up in the beaches area, Woodbine and Gerard area, if anyone's in Toronto. Okay, all right, good. Oshawa, okay. One second. Mm 
Oh yeah, this one. The 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 the, the multi act doesn't have doesn't have a sound hole. It has has like a good a little bit right here. There's like a resonance chamber of some kind. Thanks a lot, Chris. back to life I always like to warm up with that one just because it fits the fingers nicely so when I'm you know going from one style of playing to another I have to sort of segue into it through something that's like familiar I got a question here in, uh, I'm assuming it's Russian. Let me just double check. I think it is. How do you know my address? Uh, I don't know if I do. Anyway, um, dancing with her. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. Um, so Robin's got to go, but thanks for coming and hanging out. Mm, yeah, time through, I'll, uh, I'll have to wait till later because I'm in minor seven, C minor seven right now. And so I can't bounce up and down between tunings. I have to go for this one, then to that one, let it settle, then to that one, let it settle. Because with, with uh, nylon strings, it's no go with uh, rapid retuning. So. Hello, good, good, good. Yeah. All right.
Adjust to the new tuning. Still working? Hello, hello. Yeah. I haven't heard of that particular guitarist, Dentar. Raining in Northern Ontario. Pouring in New York. You mean like uh, Manhattan, like New York City or New York State? How you doing, BU? Welcome. Let me just stretch this out here. That one will definitely want to stretch back or unstretch. Take a look here. 131, not too bad. That is uh, In Her Dark Den Dance Doubles, the 2023 version, which I just kind of took the original and kind of made it a, an official, a better composition in terms of, you know, variation. Ah, cool. A welder listens to the tunes. Yeah, Tony Rice, he was actually, he's actually on the MP3 player in my car. 30 minutes north of New York City, okay. Um, Midnight Bandit, old school listener. <laughs> I, I used um, I used to like to do a version of retro. Do you remember working with the Canadian producer from Quo Vadis? Uh, Quo Vadis. I mean, that, that name doesn't ring a bell. Uh, no, it doesn't ring a bell. Quo Vetus, Street Meets asking. Do I still remember?
Thanks very much, Derek. Appreciate that. Derek B. with 100 Smackers. Let's see here. Uh, uh, Brazil. Yeah, I'd love to go to Brazil. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I know Liam Walker is asking about the GOAT, and I really like them for uh, good workhorse guitars for playing live for... You can use them for classical as well as finger style. I prefer the ones millimeters of the string spacing. It's classical string spacing. I prefer that. They do have a model that's like electric guitar string spacing for smaller hands, but I, I prefer the, the deluxe models. A percentage of donations, I mean, I think a bit, but it's not, no, I don't think it's too much. It's actually, it's, I'm surprised they don't take half of it with the way the world works. I mean, it's, uh, I'm actually quite surprised. Haven't played with Nick Johnston. No, he's in Toronto, really. The guy with the metal, um, the metal uh, font and the beard. The guy whose albums look like they, they belong in the death metal, in the death metal section of the record store. Shatton. That was um, retro from my third album. All right, now let's tune it back to um, C major. Let it sit for a second. All right, yeah, so we'll do... Um, 2000 grade sandpaper from the automotive section of the store. Never played with this Corey Huvel fellow, no. Um, Yeah, early, uh, Kevin is correct. Most of my early early songs are in variations of open C, whether it be C major, C minor, or C minor 7, or C7. And then there's a number of them that are like in C sharp major, which is like basically open D down a semitone, or D minor down a semitone. One second, you're just buffing my nails, getting ready for to play again. Rizard Lagodka from Berlin. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been there. I remember playing there twice. That was a good time. 
Okay. Don't go out of tune on me now. Okay. was asking about that earlier. And a few more songs, I wouldn't be surprised if the woodpecker comes back. That's usually the interval, like once every hour and a half or two. Uh, thanks, Liam for chipping in. That's always cool. That's how we get to keep doing what we're doing. Okay. Now, warm up with a little bit of a... Uh...
That's uh, an arrangement of a song called Bill Cheatham. Um, it is a uh, traditional bluegrass song that I kind of found a way to do it. Um, oh, Argentina, right on. That'd be another cool place to go. backing track made for Porcupine Dilemma. A lot of that stuff is just like, I explained it earlier in the stream, it's just it's, in order to, like, in order to, if there's a section of the song where it's like one guitar only for a while, I would need to have a click track going, in which I do have backing tracks for some of the stuff, but I don't have one made for that. That's just a, a money thing. <laughs> one is called Plum and Pear. Okay, so now I'll, do, I'll think of um, country style etude I think I want to do next. And then intermittently take a look and see if the woodpecker comes back. That's always fun. <laughs> on cheesecake. No. I don't eat cheesecake. Although I could probably eat two of them. Thank you. 
style etude and C. So with, um, yeah, we're checking out new guitars. Just pay attention to things like neck thickness and string spacing, because a lot of people don't think about that, they just kind of go for it without really to try, try different guitars, like ones with wider string spacing to see if it helps. Well, the deep dive, uh, Kevin asking about a deep dive with a classical composer, I kind of did that with Scarlatti because I'm not, I'm just, I'm not riding the Paganini vibe right now. Like I went so heavy into that, that it's just like, it's still there. Um, but um, I don't know, it's just not at the forefront right now, the Paganini stuff. Because I spent a lot of time with that. Like I read, I'm going to go through some books here. I got books on Paganini. Like I was fully immersed. Okay. Um. Could we do that one?
There, that one came out okay, Little Angels. There's a one part in it where I haven't played it in a while. When I'm playing it, it's like, it's like all of, okay, it's like when I'm playing that song, if I haven't practiced it in a while, it's cooking. And then I come to this like long, thin bridge and it's like missing planks, <laughs> but it actually went okay that time. I've had it where I've had it on streams. I've had it on streams where it uh, comes to that place and then I'm like, what's going on? Uh, but yeah, it went okay, so I'm glad. Uh, so Josh can relate to the uh, to the metaphor. <laughs> You're, everything's fine, and then you come to this bridge, a thin bridge with rope made out of rope and wood, and then there's missing planks, and you're like, "Oh boy, gotta cross this." My God. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, I need one moment here. Okay, give me like one minute. All right. So Josh got his favorite tune. Right on. Okay. So one moment here. Is not back yet. So let us continue. Everything was fine, but then came a bridge. Yes. Uh, okay, so let's think this through. What shall it be if anything doesn't come to mind? Oh, I know. There is one that I did. I think I brought it back in the set list. Should be okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mega Man 2, do I even, like, like I can, I could sort of mess it up, um, because, um, well, let's see here, uh, where, where would I find that, that's on Acoustic Metal 1, let's just take a look here at it, um, because there's a couple things that I don't recall about that, okay, so that's the alternate here, I don't want that. Ah, oh, okay, there it is. Now, what's this one? Okay, there's this one chord that I don't recall. That's it right there. that crazy part hold on i gotta check the tab for this uh oh right so i don't remember this one yeah. uh, it's been a long time let me just look at this part right here uh, okay what is it it's right up here it's um uh, uh, time but yeah the, I think I rewrote that part down lower as for for a lesson that I did yeah anyway I don't know the whole thing uh, let's practice it right now let's just do that um, yeah Marley it's been a while 
Yeah, so Morin, Moran and Norster, are there any birds left in your area that, could, that, are, that are still flying around but haven't visited me? There's a couple that haven't uh, landed, like, for example, the morning dove, the white-throated sparrow, the red-winged blackbird, um, black and white warbler, pileated woodpecker, and I think that's it. All the others have landed. Here, let, let, me, let me practice that a bit. Hold on here. Um, because that's the part I don't, that's the part right there that I haven't played in ages. Something like that. I could pull it together, but that's the, the main gist of Mega Man. One second. Okay. Someone was asking about my nightmare. Probably do that. to open C. Got to stretch out the strings. Oh, Libya, cool. So should I do, um, I don't, I know your pain too would be, would be spotty, it would be. I 
forget. like that i know you're paying too but it's been a while i could i could probably do it if i sat down for like 20 30 minutes and just kind of refreshed it okay now still no woodpecker the mic still works let's try this one Thank you. 
It takes a moment. That's a different one. Yeah, he doesn't normally do that. Okay, so that's not the same woodpecker. Yeah, no, that's a different one. Never mind. Could be. same one. All right, now, so that's time version three. That video just came out on Candy Rat Records uh, a couple days ago, maybe the day before yesterday. Now let's do the uh, I Know Your Pain Time Where Are You medley that was a part of that time three EP. And then I get to get the other guitar to play Motion Potion, a nylon version. And then, uh, what are we at? What are we at here? Like three hours? Yeah, 328. No wonder. Okay, yeah. So I, can, I, don't, I don't have too much left to, uh, to give um, energy-wise. So anyway.
Let me switch up. What's going on here? Oh, the vocal harmonizer came on. We had a brief power failure, which is why the sound cut out. But luckily, it was just the wind, and it flickered, and just needed everything needed to reset. All right, so I'm gonna switch guitars. Hold on. What the heck? Oh, right, that thing. There. Let me switch up here. Um, yeah, this seems fine. Mute that. Try to get another multi app. Um, which one are we going to go for? Hold on. Okay, now, hello, hello, good. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Are you serious? Yeah, Canada, um, in New Brunswick now, used to live in Ontario. And where's the glass slide? Here it is. The glass one. Remember this one?
remember the IRC days? With the guitarist chat room from like the year 2000, from like 98, maybe 99 through 2002, something like that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's been like three and a half hours, so I'm not, I'm not going to be playing like as good as I can. I'll think of, uh, here, let me just switch guitars once more. Uh, which one should we go for? Classical? It might work. Maybe that one because I have worked on it recently. is good just checking up here um, okay
pretty much done I want to talk about um yeah we're three three hours 46 minutes so you got to understand if I keep playing it's just going to be diminishing returns it'll just be like yeah it'll be like you know a car running out of gas is there anything else that comes to mind that I could actually play at this point because I probably couldn't play my most difficult stuff right now just thinking here Thank you. 
There we go. Orange. Do I even know that one? I know your pain earlier along with uh, it was part of the medley blue rose I don't know it honestly in terms of like like a couple of I haven't played it in a long time there's no backing track for it either a lot of that stuff is just I just record it so just to compose something <laughs> I'm going to uh, take a break for a second here to wrap up with uh, something else. Hold on a second. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so recommended books, actually, because I, I brought a stack out because I knew I was going to Gonna need to uh, need to like rest after that, like three and a half hours. All right, so this is a good book, "Games People Play" by Eric Burney. And so it, it, it's an analysis of the unconscious games that people play as part of um, what you might call transactions. And so there's a whole list of them. And so if, when you begin to spot them, the games that people play, uh, and you, but the thing is, if you don't participate and you maintain a deadpan approach, then people think you're autistic because you're not mim uh, you're not mimicking the um, the micro gestures of the people around you, which is kind of like the social. It's kind of like the um, that's an unconscious thing that people do is they're always mimicking micro gestures and uh, emotions. And uh, once you f once you spot people playing games then you remain deadpan and it, people think you're strange, but it, it's, it's more or less because you're not playing these games. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, I, think I, I think I highlighted what he, what he said his definition was. Games are power plays for strokes which are necessary for psychological survival in grown-ups, but which are generally in pervasive scarcity because of the inhibiting social and internal rules which prevent people from exchanging them freely. Anyway, good book, um, Games People Play, Eric Burney. And Propaganda by Jacques Ellul. He analyzes right down to the like, a scientific analysis of propaganda, the way that it's used, the way that it affects you, and the different types of it. Really excellent book, highly recommended. Lenin, The State and Revolution. Now, the, the reason this is good to read is when you, when you read about communism right from, like, the head honcho, pretty much. Um, not, well, maybe not. Maybe they would consider Marx. But anyway, um, it, it just flows right off the page. You, you think it makes perfect sense. But the one thing that doesn't seem to make, that kind of goes under it, is they, it asserts that um, the common man will become the state. It'll just kind of go through end stage capitalism, transition, the common man will become the state. But the thing is what actually did, what ends, what ends up happening is it actually goes from like the, the 1% to the 0.001% in terms of the consolidation of power. It just becomes a smaller oligarchy. That's what really happens. But it's good to read it because as you're reading it, you're like, yeah, this makes perfect sense. Every working person would think this and would want this the way that it's, uh, the way that it's laid out. So yeah. Good read. The Politics of Experience, R.D. Lang. It flips the 
the pyramid upside down in terms of who gets to say who's crazy and who isn't. The politics of experience, R.D. Lang actually says that in, in a lot of the cases that he um, witnessed with people with schizophrenia and, very, and, and various um, mental illnesses was that he, was, uh, he thought that their symptoms were actually a very rational response to um, controlling relationships or um, insurmountable circumstances in their life. And so, yeah, good perspective on this one. Politics of experience. I don't buy it wholeheartedly. It's like he, you don't flip the pyramid entirely and just say, well, everyone who's crazy is sane and everyone who's sane is crazy. But in some cases, that would seem to be the case. I would recommend the whole Nietzsche collection. Twilight of the Idols, The Antichrist, um, The Gay Science. What's the other one? Twilight of the Idols, I already said that. Um, Beyond Good and Evil. Thus spoke Zarathustra. It's all good. The thing I like about Nietzsche is the way that he exposes things as being power plays when in fact they may on the surface seem to be nothing more than... Um, he, he doesn't buy into the good by definition uh, aspect of people's ego. He questions it and he, in, in many cases he asserts that it's nothing more than a power, a power play in disguise. The Epic of Gilgamesh, really good because it's I think it's the oldest story that we have available to us and it shows all of the um, archetypes and themes that will appear in uh, mythology and religions that come after the fact, this being the oldest one. But yeah, old Epic of Gilgamesh, it's quite good. One second. All right, mass control, engineering human consciousness, really good. Basically talks about all of the, uh, talks about CIA, MK Ultra, uh, the man, Esther Brooks and the Manchurian candidate. Um, it also talks about something that happened in Montreal, Canada, where they, uh, they used electroshock therapy to test if they could wipe out someone's personality. Uh, just with electricity, with electronic voltage, and just to see if you could actually re, uh, forcefully re-educate someone's mind to bring it back to a blank slate. So yeah, Mass Control, Engineering Human Conscious Consciousness by Jim Keith. <clears throat> and this too, the Upanishads, the Dhammapada, really good. This is sort of like, I guess the Upanishads is more like Hindu, Indian wisdom, the Dhammapada is Buddhist, which I guess is an offshoot of Hinduism, if you think about it. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations. He's one of the Stoic philosophers. Also happened to be a Roman emperor. And what's interesting apparently about this book is that while he's writing it, everything that you would see in this, if you chart the, the, I guess the time periods that this was written in, there was a lot going on in this guy's life. There was all sorts of things that were happening with Rome, but it doesn't show in his writing, which is interesting. But it's a good, uh, it's a good read. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations. Schopenhauer. On the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason, this is apparently what you have to read before you read the world as will and representation, because this is the foundation upon which he, I guess he wrote his uh, magnum opus, uh, the world as will and representation. So yeah, on the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason. Schopenhauer. This is more Nietzsche, Beyond Good and Evil. David Hume, Dialogues and Natural History of Religion. <clears throat> so he, oh, there's too much to cover in this. Um, one of the things he brings up is that when, in, in terms of cause and effect, he says that the way that we know cause and effect is within the world as we know it, um, not before the supposed creation of time, and everything we witnessed in cause and effect has been within our lifetime. And so he considers it to be an error, an error if we assert that there was a cause before the fact that we, ca that we have no um, way of measuring. So, for example, the assertion that 
there was such and so before the universe began, it had this effect. And then according, and then after the universe, there will be this, whatever, this other afterlife or this other part of the plan. He says, all we know about cause and effect has been observed within this lifetime, within the time period that we know. So the, the idea of a cause before time is actually a nonsensical, it's actually a nonsensical term so far as he sees it. And he also brings up how uh, he brings up epistemological um, consistency in terms of his challenges against religion, such as if you believe the claims of miracles in, in one particular scripture, why, would, why wouldn't you believe therefore all of them? See what I mean? Really, really good read. Uh, it was published after his death. And the idea was that apparently he had to, he, he wanted to wait for that to be the case. Otherwise he just would have faced too much, too many problems, I guess, with getting with publishers and uh, probably negative press. Thus spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche. I think I have the complete works of him. I'm okay, you're okay. Now this one is, is um, it's not like the ultimate foundation of psychology, but it does outline communication methods and how they get crossed and become ineffective um, in relationships where one where it either becomes one of power or one of submission. And it outlines the different forms of communication so that you can identify if someone's crossing the lines of communication, which renders them inoperable or useless. So um, some people criticize it in terms of like, yeah, this isn't going to be uh, totally foundational. Um, you can't take it, all of it as though it's some sort of like ideological basis, but it's got some good stuff in here. It's a good introduction to, I guess, r certain roles that people play whether it be adult to adult, child to adult, adult to child, and these being uh, leftover psychological imprints from our upbringing. And so some people are in the habit of playing the role of the child or the role of the adult talking down to the child when really in, uh, this, to strive for, um, op for healthy communication would be, you know, uh, what they call I'm okay, you're okay from mid-level adult, adult to adult rather than crossing the lines of communication, which is what he refers to it as. That's a good one. And this is what I'm reading right now. The basic writings of Sigmund Freud. And it has within it, um, psychopathology of everyday life, the interpretation of dreams, three contributions to the theory of sex, wit and its relation to the unconscious totem and taboo and the history of the psychoanalytic movement. I'm reading his uh, chapter on dreams, um, or his his essays on them, materials and sources of dreams. He uh, he thinks that they are wish fulfillment. Ultimately, that's where we're at. So that's where I'm at so far in this. Not done yet, though. The Power of Parable, by John Dominic Crossman. How fiction by Jesus became fiction about Jesus. It's a point of view regarding. Um, I guess, somewhat of a mythological assessment of the Book of Acts. Yeah, it's been a while since I read this one. The Gay Science, Frederick Nietzsche. The Bhagavad Gita. The, basically, it's a, um, I think it was one of the gods, there was a, a battles about to take place and I think the leader of the army gets approached by one of the gods in, in a human form and is, he dictates, the god dictates to this person the whole Bhagavad Gita. This is a good one to have. Um, the Eastern Greek Orthodox translation, translation of the New Testament because what you'll find is that the word hell doesn't actually appear. It's actually Guiana and Hades. And so in Orthodox churches, they say... Um, Instead of deliver a valley where they would sacrifice children or something, some, some other religion would perform sacrifices uh, in that valley that they, I guess, uh, weren't cool with. But yeah, this, and this translation wasn't available for quite a long time in the Western world, as far as I know. It was like the King James and NIV. This is hard to get. This is Domenico Scarlatti by Ralph Kirkpatrick. 
the life of Scarlatti. He was under the, I think it was in, what was it, Portugal? I think it was the, he ended up, he ended up with the Queen of Spain. Uh, the, the Queen of Spain was his um, patron. He taught her, and I think the, the, king, the king of Spain as well, how to play harpsichord, and he wrote a lot of his pieces for her. And what makes Scarlatti's music unique is the Spanish influence in it, mixing with the Italian classical, which is, I guess, the Partimento style, mixing with Spanish influence. And if you listen to Scarlatti's music, you can hear within it um, remnants or the even the origins of flamenco. So they did a they did a demonstration where they played a Scarlatti sonata to a flamenco dancer and the dance steps lined up perfectly with the music. But what's interesting about that is that flamenco actually came after Scarlatti. So he kind of was, he, he kind of fused elements that later became flamenco into his music. So yeah, Domenico Scarlatti, Ralph Kirkpatrick. Meister Eckhart, Selected Writings. And he, they consider him a mystic. He was a, he was charged with, um, formally charged with what's the, what was it? Um, what's the word again? Um, uh, I forget the word. Basically, you know, he he the things that he were write, that he was writing were against church doctrine, against Catholic doctrine, heresy. He was charged with heresy. Interesting to check out. Meister Eckhart, selected writings. And it, it's well written, and you wonder why uh, he would be charged with heresy by the uh, Catholic Church. Modern Man in Search of a Sh uh, in Search of a Soul, Carl Jung. That's a good one. Now this one here, this is huge. This is the discovery of the unconscious by Henry Ellenberger. It's the history of psychiatry, going right back into tribal methods that they would that they would use to uh, heal or attempt to heal people who had I don't know, had, had emotional illnesses or had me, uh, had mental illness to whatever degree, irrational fears, and it just goes from tribal to, from from their knowledge of tribal psychology and psychiatry right up to Freud. And I guess the early 20th century. It's a good one. I recommend this for everyone. Collected Essays of Arthur Schopenhauer. It's the best book. One of the best books I think I've ever read. I mean, when you read it, you're just like, that's what I've been thinking all along. Perfect descriptions. Perfect descriptions. This one's also good. The book your church doesn't want you to read. Just with an alternate perspective on some of the uh, some some of the dogma that makes you reflect on whether or not you can actually know it to be the case. The world as will and idea, Schopenhauer, excellent. But you have to read the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason to set the stage before you read this. This. Uh, it's excellent. Nietzsche apparently read it, and the first thing he did when he finished it was he read it again. It really inspired him. Almost done. If you're into Paganini, these are the best books on Paganini you can get. Paganini, the Genoese, Volume 1, by G.I.C. de Corsi. And then Volume 2, this is really difficult to get. I don't even know if you can get it anymore. Um, Paganini, the Genoese, Volume 2. It's basically his life... And all the other books that are biographies on Paganini um, cite these as their main sources. So if you get these, you don't have to deal with the other books. Paganini, the Genoese, Volume 1 and 2. His full life story and even excerpts from uh, letters that he wrote. Best books on Paganini. The Myth of Male Power. This is an excellent book. It... Um, it basically tells the other side of the roles that are put upon us, but it discusses the male roles that society enforces on men. And it outlines how it's not necessarily smoking cigars and, you know, doing as you please. So I'd actually recommend that. That's, uh, that's a good one. Heaven and Hell, Bart Ehrman. It talks about... Um, how the notions of hell, how they evolved over time, where they, where they came from, and how a lot of the 
for, for example, in the Old Testament, Old Judaism didn't have this notion of hell. It just had this Sheol, the underworld. It, um, this, this notion of he fire and brimstone and hell was a later, it was a later addition. And he also points out something interesting is that you can find in literature, religious literature, plenty of descriptions of hell. For example, in the Apocalypse of Peter and some other uh, religious texts, but you can't get too many descriptions of heaven. So hell, there's all of these, you know, Dante's Inferno, you got the Apocalypse of Peter, vivid descriptions. But when it comes to heaven, very, there's not much of a, uh, there's not much of a description of that. So if you're, if you're haunted by the notion of hell, um, uh, as the selling point of any of your belief system, maybe check this one out, Heaven and Hell by Bart Ehrman. And these three books here, E. Mulchorin, The Trouble with Being Born. This guy's a pessimist philosopher, but he's quite good. A Short History of Decay and On the Heights of Despair. His position is that the world doesn't deserve to be known because when things are investigated, they break down into absurdity. And he sees things as more of a comedy. Emil Chorin, it's a good, it's an interesting perspective. And the one, and the one that I just read, the, Ram, the Ramayana, a tale of Vishnu coming in the form of four brothers, but uh, it's similar to the idea of God coming in the form of Christ. But in this case, uh, he came as it was Vishnu coming as Rama and it was like he had three brothers but I guess the highest concentration of Vishnu's power was in Rama and to lesser degrees in his other um into his other brothers there it's a basically uh, he's about to inherit a kingdom he gets banished with his wife because of like his stepmother wants some uh, another family member to take the throne and then they're banished and then uh, his wife was captured by a demon king and there's a huge battle um and so yeah this is the story of uh vishnu coming in the flesh but it's uh, it's an interesting perspective those are my books well not all of them just the ones that i brought out all right so we're like four hours in i'm probably gonna call it thanks for coming and hanging out uh, next week, there is a stream um, on the Candy Rat Records channel, same time, 12 noon Eastern, next Saturday on the Candy Rat Records channel. So look, look for that because I'm doing another stream there. I'm just going to read here. Michael F. I've been reading for the past, I guess, six years or so, but I got a whole bunch of others in the, in the other room. I got like a a bookshelf filled but yeah Schopenhauer is probably my favorite um Emil Emil Chiorin, he's uh he's almost like an answer to Nietzsche like it goes it goes Schopenhauer and then Nietzsche tries to undo Schopenhauer's pessimism and then Emil Chiorin just says the whole thing is ludicrous and gives his perspective to help me with energy for playing today rather than coffee or something like that because I try to stay off of coffee. All right, so next Saturday, 12 noon Eastern, Candy Rat Records channel, another stream. And then after that, I have some actual, I have some real world shows going on. Not that this isn't the real world, but you know what I mean. And it looks like the woodpecker's not coming back, but we did get them earlier. You can, you can go and... Uh, uh, check that out earlier in the stream. Do I think reading about Paganini's life shed any light on how you play his music? Um, let's see, Paganini. <clears throat> Let me see here. So what happened with Paganini was that um, his he was really talented when he was younger and he had a run in with fame, but he couldn't handle it when he was younger and, I, and he took some time off and then ended up, uh, he ended up in Parma or was it? I know on the court of uh, Napoleon's sister had taken over some portion of Italy and he was a musician of the court. And then at some point he just went for the money. He just went and started touring. And what happened was he started to make tons of money. I mean, just absolutely tons. Uh, and at some point that just took over. It was just like more, more, more. And next thing, and then at one point, syphilis he had syphilis and then that affected his judgment 
And then he began to, he took some bad business offers, a bad business offer to open up a, a, a casino in Paris called the Casino Paganini. And he just went for the money and he started to act um, a bit too pompous in, in front of the, I guess the people that had more money than he did that were, that ran the state. And they just threw the book at him. Like they just jacked the fine up. They find him. Um, and then he just spent the rest of his life depressed at, at a billiards hall and where he lived on the upstairs floor in a, in some place in France. So that's what happened with, uh, with Paganini is that he, uh, was the first person to experience fame on a high level as a solo musician, um, and tour. And because he, because there was no perspective on that, there were no people who had been down that road before he fell into the classic traps that being a public figure, um, uh, we'll put you in the position of, we'll put you in the position of, yeah, he fell into these traps of, uh, for example, they would taunt him in the press and he would write long letters and essentially verbally fight, you know, in the form of letters to the people who would, I guess, criticize him. And it just, it drove him nuts. And that sort of amplified their, their success in bothering him. And then it just uh, tons of bad luck, just like his teeth, all of his lower teeth fell out on a tour. Like imagine being on tour and then all of your lower teeth fall out and you have an infected jawbone. And then he started looking like, like strange because he had no lower teeth. It was just, it was pretty crazy, but he, but he kept going and he had a couple of brushes with death. Um, but I think what it was is he became obsessed with wanting to get like a Royal title to be a baron or something because he wanted to get to the higher levels of status and it just he got so obsessed with it that it uh it became it it, it was his undoing yeah anyway so I, i'm gonna end that thanks again and thanks for listening to my talk on books but that's, it's it's interesting for me i find all that stuff interesting philosophy history history of religion mythology um all of it so we'll see you maybe next week. Candy Rat Records Channel, noon, New York City time. Take care.